Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to continue our exploration of human resource uh, management issues within sport. This time, we're going to be talking about a very popular topic known as the law of agency and athlete agents. And so I'm going to suppress my urge to uh, indiscriminately shout out lines from Jerry Maguire, and we'll just get on from, uh, with the lesson plan. So again, we're traveling through the section of the textbook where we're looking at issues from a human resources management perspective. And as sport managers, uh, we are managing an organization for, in terms of uh, various contexts. And within t uh, this context, within agency, which we'll talk about very shortly, and management, where this crops up is negotiation uh, between a party and another party concerning business transactions. Uh, and a lot of major legal issues that the textbook talks about is whether or not a sufficiently, sufficient agency relationship has been created by virtue of contract law, what are those rights and responsibilities going between the parties, and that touches on both agency law and contract law, which we talked about previously. And then um, once a valid agency relationship has been established, what are sort of the potential What's the potential liability between the agent and the principal as well as the related to the third party? And that can come in a variety of forms, whether it be contract law, agency law, tort law. What happens if the agent says something that binds the principal to uh, the third party, but that the principal did not authorize that and, and creates potential legal issues? And then from a, a more... Uh, a, a more sports-specific context, looking at some of the major issues in uh, the field that sport managers very well might come in contact with. Uh, we have issues of the day concerning student-athletes and the loss of their amateur status and ability to compete in, in NCAA events uh, due to uh, dealing with an agent. And that's where we see, in addition to the law of agency, uh, statutes such as the uh, uh, Sport and Agent uh, uh, Responsibility and Trust Act, or SPARTA, and then the Uniform Athlete Agent Act, which would then be adopted by the different states, come into play as a way to police um, potential issues involving um, acting in, in bad faith or unethically in trying to remedy that. And then, of course, um, at the end of the chapter, there's talk about athlete representation and regulation of, of athlete agents, which is done both via statute and, and other laws, as well as um, through players associations, which we'll talk about. So a lot to get into. So let's jump into it. So really, what is agency? Well, agency is when one person, known as the principal, creates a desire to have that other person, known as the agent, act on his or her behalf, and that the agent will uh, end up being subject to the principal's control, and usually in exchange for compensation, the agent consents to do so. So really, agency is just a, a specifically stated out relationship between two parties where both sides are giving up something and both sides are receiving something. And in this situation, one party agrees to act as the representative of the other party and the other side agrees to uh, compensate them. So agency law really defines how and when within this agency relationship, how that's created and what rights and responsibilities exist upon both sides. When it, an a student athlete is going pro and they sign a contract with an agent to allow that agent, uh, to empower that agent to negotiate on her behalf, um, that creates specific obligations that the, that the agent must be bound by. And then in turn, the principal is bound by specific obligations as well. So there's different types of agency relationships, and the textbook lays it out very quickly. There's employer and employee, and an example usually is where the employer hires an employee, and that person is going to perform a service under the control as well as the direction of that employer. Usually that doesn't create specific uh, principal-agent uh, responsibilities in terms of fiduciary relationships, but instead is governed by 
uh, the law of contracts uh, due to that employment relationship that has been established. And we talked about that in prior chapters. If you're interested in that, uh, we can go, you can go back and, and look at that. Um, so more specific to the uh, law of agency that we see is the principal and the agent, where the principal, which is the one that's um, empowering the agent to act on his or her behalf, hires the agent and provides that person authority to act on his or her behalf and enter into contracts and, uh, and, and, and bind that principal. So common examples within uh, sport, we see the professional athlete signing a contract to uh, appoint and authorize their athlete agent to negotiate contracts on their behalf. Finally, we have um, principal independent contractor, and that is just not an employee, but someone who is a non-employee who agrees to perform some certain task for the principal for a limited duration in time and a limited scope. So um, it could be that a university and a general contractor are building a new stadium and the university uh, authorizes the general contractor to act as the, uh, as the independent contractor to make those, uh, to perform that construction, but there's no sort of authority uh, that has been uh, provided to that principal in terms of um, acting as their agent. So how do you create an agency relationship? Well, mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked. Creating an agency relationship is much like the, realm, the law of contracts. So let's go back to what is required to create a contract. Does anyone remember? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. So you need it to be, first, there needs to be mutual consent between the parties. So offer, acceptance, consideration. And then there also needs to be, um, the, the, the subject of the contract needs to be a subject that's legal, so it can't be illegal, and then both sides must have capacity. So if there is a, if there is a meeting of the minds to create a valid contract, and that contract is governing a legal topic, and everyone's of sound mind, then you have the building blocks to create an agency relationship. And that what's in that agency relationship is going to um, govern the, the, the uh, balance of the relationship between the parties. You can have both informal and formal agreements. So it could be uh, potentially an oral contract, uh, but usually it's going to be a written contract because an oral contract the, uh, cannot be, um, it, you can't really have a valid oral contract if the statute of frauds applies. So if it's something that, where the statute of frauds requires it to be written, so it's something, for example, a couple of examples, a, um, an agreement where it, the terms of the agreement cannot be performed within one year, or if, it, if it, the value of the goods or services is in $500 or more, et cetera, et cetera. So in short, basic contract law principles apply. And if you actually are able to create a, um, a binding contract between the two parties, then you would have a, um, you would have a, um, a valid agency agreement. So what does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. I will show you. So here's an example where we see an agency agreement being created. Uh, so the NFL Players Association is an entity that has been created by the players and for the players. And it is the arm of the players that's supposed to bargain collectively on their behalf and work with the NFL and the National Football League to improve um, the the lot that the players have that improve their conditions and improve all aspects of their employment their uh, uh, they are um, their union now one of the um, purviews of the players association that that it's, that they've carved out for themselves is also to authorize who can be agents to represent NFL players. And as part of that process, the NFLPA has created a standard player contract agreement 
uh, or I'm sorry, a, a standard representation agreement where the um, agent and the player can use this to set out the terms of the relationship, the contract agreement. So you can see here that it, there's general principles and then in terms of the specific services, the contract advisors represents um, that well, actually uh, under contract services, um, the player is going to authorize the agent to represent, advise, counsel, and assist player in negotiation, execution, and enforcement of his playing contract in the National Football League. So here it lays out some of the some of the duties and responsibilities. Here is the compensation aspect, and that's just some of the aspects of this contract, which is available for your review as well if you want. We'll come back to that. So how does this work? So once there has been a relationship created by contract between the principal and the agent, and we've got an, an agency contract, then the principal is empowered or is, is empowering the agent to act as its fiduciary, or I guess his or her fiduciary, and the agent then will represent the interests of the principal and contact third parties on behalf of the principal to engage in whatever business the, um, the principal has authorized the agent to do. And so this sort of authority flows from the principal to the agent to interact with the third party, in this case with the uh, NFL, uh, NFL PA and player, all acting, uh, in, uh, uh, all acting together. The principal is the player, the agent is the athlete agent, and the third party is an NFL franchise. Now, the principal has also, uh, uh, in addition to authorizing the agent to act on the principal's behalf, the agent is able to bind the principal to the third, third party based on whatever terms of the contract the sides come up with. So here, there's a fiduciary relationship that's created between the principal and the agent. And the agent must act for the principal's benefit uh, concerning all matters related uh, to that agency relationship. And this is called the duty of loyalty and the duty of good faith. And that basically means that the agent cannot put the interests of the agent before the principal. And so both the principal and the agent owe duties to the other. Um, within a fiduciary relationship, the principal owes the agent the duty to uh, provide compensation that is uh, laid out in the in the representation contract and that the principal will also reimburse the agent for whatever um, cost the agent spends in performing his or her duties. So if, if uh, the NFL agent uh, is going and um, in the contract between the player and the agent, the player or the, the agent says that he will front the cost for training um, the player and getting him in tip shop tip top shape in advance of the NFL draft. And if it says in the contract that the agent need or that the principal needs to reimburse the agent for those costs, then that would be a duty that the principal owes to the agent. Now again, the agent owes to the a duty of good faith and loyalty to the principal. Again, meaning that the agent's not going to put his or her interests above uh, the principal, so you're not gonna, it's not going to engage in self-dealing like we saw with the Argovitz case. As well, um, the agent owes the duty to actually um, be at the competent, uh, be a competent professional at, to the level or point at which the agent holds itself out to be. And in terms of identifying a fiduciary relationship, whether or not a fiduciary relationship exists, one should ask whether or not a higher degree of trust 
or confidence is vested by the principal to the agent. And if we have a higher degree of confidence that's going from the principal to the agent, if they're dealing with sensitive matters, if um, the principal is actually implicitly trusting the agent to act in, on, in his or her um, best interests, then more likely than not you have a fiduciary relationship and those specific duties of loyalty and, no, and not engaging in self-dealing and engaging in faith apply. The textbook talks about different types of authority that exist in an agency relationship. So once an agency relationship has been established, um, the agent very well might have different, uh, different levels of authority. Uh, the first and most common authority is actual authority uh, express, meaning that the authority has been vested from the principal to the agent in a formal uh, written or oral agreement that's made between the two parties. And this goes back to um, the language in the, um, in the NFL PA uh, standard representation agreement where it says here, that the that the contract advisor, which is the agent, is going to um, advise or represent, advise and counsel and assist the player in negotiation, execution and enforcement of his playing contract in the in the National Football League. Um, you can also see in here that in that explicitly says that the contract advisor is acting within the fiduciary capacity on behalf of the player and so must and so agrees to protect the best interests of the player. So it's built right into um, the, the contract. Uh, however, it also says that the contract advisor shall not have the actual authority to bind or commit the player to enter into any contract without actual execution of, uh, without actual execution of the player uh, signing off. So um, we've got specific authority here to advise and counsel the player and represent them in contract negotiations. So generally speaking, that agent is able to represent that, um, that he or she has the actual expressed authority to represent that player in contract negotiations. Now, if it's not, and, and also it's expressly limiting the authority of the agent in certain situations, such as if the player has not signed off on that contract. Actual authority implied is where the, um, the authority is given to the agent from the principal to the agent implicitly because that authority is necessary in order for the agent to uh, execute his or her duties. So the textbook gives an example where you've got an agent um, that has uh, been been authorized to um, go out and, and be a sales agent for the company to sell sporting goods. And um, although it doesn't say necessarily within the contract that the agent is able to um, reorder a, a specific amount of goods to sell, on behalf of the principal, um, the, the agent would not be able to do his or her job without being able to have that inventory. So implicit, implied in the express authority given to that agent is the uh, implied actual authority that the agent is able to order that um, those goods. Put a different way, if we go back to the NFL uh, example involving the agent and the player, if the player has authorized the agent to negotiate contracts with NFL teams on behalf of the player, then maybe perhaps it doesn't say that the player is able or that the agent is able to solicit um, uh, the uh, different uh, franchises as to whether or not they're interested in, uh, let's say he's a free agent, and um, solicit whether or not that that organization is interested in that player, um, if that language is not in that contract, but he is authorized to represent and counsel and negotiate his playing contract, 
then one could reasonably conclude that he also has the actual implied authority to solicit uh, um, teams when he's a free agent. And then we have something called apparent authority, which is uh, not the same at all as actual authority, because apparent authority really means that the agent does not have any authority whatsoever, but instead the third party believes, uh, based on the conduct and statements of the principal, that the agent actually does have the authority to act on behalf of the principal and make statements to bind the principal, even if that's not the case. And again, this goes under a reasonable standard that the uh, third party must reasonably believe that the uh, that the agent has authority. Um, so the, the textbook gives the example of the the case where there was a company that was negotiating with a, with a motor speedway and they were uh, negotiating a contract. And the two parties had done business before. And so the, on, the, the, the uh, advertising company was negotiating with a couple of executives from the company. And the one, uh, the, 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 co the advertising company started off negotiating with one person representing the company and then switched to another person. And that uh, second person negotiating on behalf of the company had created the, the appearance and representation uh, that he was able to bind the company and the uh, agencies tried to, said that they wanted to uh, negotiate in higher rates for the services for the subsequent contract. And based on the appearance of uh, the fact that that second executive uh, was given the authority by the company, even if that was not the case, the court ruled that um, the second uh, executive's um, implicit or seemingly accepting of the higher terms uh, did bind the uh, third party, or did bind the company. Sorry, it bound the company. So finally, we've got ratification. And this is where, again, no actual authority exists but the principal accepts or ratifies the unauthorized acts. So here, um, within this uh, NFL PA player agent uh, template, I believe there is language in here that says that the, um, that the player agent is prohibited from acting as a financial advisor. And this is only to be a contract advisor. So here the uh, agent does not have the authority to actually um, do anything from a financial standpoint. But let's say that the agent somehow is able to access the principal, here the player, his funds, and invests that money in some sort of financial opportunity in the stock market, a business opportunity, land, and, and this has happened. Um, usually the, the agent um, has some sort of authorization to act in, 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 um, in all situations, in all business situations for the player, which of course that is, um, can, can be dangerous. But the, let's say that in this situation, the Agent only had the, the uh, authorization to represent the player in contractual negotiations, but that the agent took it upon his or her, his himself or herself and invested money in a business opportunity, and that that money that business opportunity was actually paying the the player dividends. So once the player becomes aware of the actions of the agent, instead of uh, moving to uh, uh, to penalize the agent, whether it's through uh, a breach of contract lawsuit or other means. Let's say the player actually says, well, okay, I like what you did. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. That would be a ratification of the agent's uh, actions, even though it was without authority. So to summarize here, here are the, here's the uh, duties of the parties in an agency relationship. We've got multiple duties of the principal to the agent, so pay 
uh, pay what you said you're going to pay the agent and reimburse them for uh, for expenses that were incurred in executing their relationship, their contractual relationship and fiduciary relationship. Uh, make sure that the um, agent has working is working in safe conditions, and make sure that um, you are um, performing reasonably uh, to the standard that you had bound yourself. Now, the duties of the agent to the principal are a bit more comprehensive. The duty of cooperation, the duty of loyalty, the duty of accounting, the duty of obedience. So, of course, cooperation and loyalty more focus on acting in good faith and not engaging in self-dealing. And uh, duty of obedience, following the instructions of the agent. So if the uh, agent is not authorized to uh, provide financial investment advice or engage in or invest the, the principal's money, uh, don't do that. Follow instructions. And the duty of accounting, make sure that the funds are used properly. Uh, that, or I'm sorry, that, um, that um, an accounting is able, is able to be provided for where funds and property is. So um, there's also an issue involving potential liability when uh, the, the uh, existence of the principal is either disclosed, partially disclosed, or not disclosed. And so in these situations, um, a if, if a third part, if an agent does disclose the identity of the principal, uh, then th only the principal is potentially liable uh, for whatever uh, the agent binds to the third party, binds on behalf of the, of the principal to the third party. Now, an undisclosed or an unidentified uh, principal potentially could carry liability to the agent uh, and will uh, carry liability to the principal. And then an undisclosed third party um, Potentially, uh, it would uh, it would bind liability to the agent and potentially to the third party, but the the principal is always liable for an agent's authorized acts. So once a relationship between the principal and agent has been established there are certain legal issues that come up. And the common ones that we see from a managerial perspective are the relationship between the athlete and the athlete agent once the uh, relationship has been created and there's issues of fiduciary relationship, uh, uh, whether or not the uh, agent is acting um, pursuant to his or her fiduciary duty. Uh, then we also see issues involving athlete agents trying to court student athletes um, while they're in college to secure their services, potentially voiding their liability. And then we see issues involving agents and agencies where they're competing for clients and um, the textbook references several examples where an agent wants to go to another agency, but there's a, a pretty uh, draconian covenant not to compete uh, within that contract. Uh, which we talked about last uh, in our contracts uh, session. But these are some of the issues that arise and that we're going to get into. So um, as future sport managers, it's important to understand how the law works in regard to issues involving agency and player agents. And what we see uh, in terms of understanding the law is that Issues of agency law come up involving the conduct of athlete agents and players, and we as sport managers who will be occupying different areas of this industry will be, will be impacted by these issues. So whether or not you yourself want to become an athlete agent, and usually that means getting not only uh, graduating from an undergraduate uh, level program with a bachelor's, but also getting a master's or an advanced degree. And most of these um, players associations now require um, athlete agents to uh, hold an advanced degree. So um, if you're an agent or if you work in compliance 
or if you're actually a student athlete or a professional athlete, or work for the NCAA, uh, or work on the professional team side, you could see uh, many of these issues come up in your practice. So it's important to understand how it works and what issues need to be identified and avoided in terms of liability. So one of the different ways that um, one of the different ways to address potential legal issues involving uh, agency uh, and, and uh, athlete agent issues uh, come in the form of the Uniform Athlete Agent Act. And the Uniform Athlete Agent Act was created uh, in about the year 2000 as a way to address the potential vacuum that existed involving unscrupulous agents uh, who were preying on um, either unsuspecting student athletes or were engaging in unethical activity uh, and avoiding student athletes' uh, eligibility and then hurting not only the player but the, the university and the other stakeholders in, involved in college athletics. So it was intended um, to uh, regulate student athletes as well as protect that, I'm sorry, intended to regulate athlete agents and protect student athletes. And there's different elements within the Uniform Athlete Agent Act. And one of these elements is a notification requirement that requires uh, athlete agents, uh, as well as a student athlete, to notify their institution in the event that an agency contract is signed between the two sides. And any sort of failure to uh, abide by uh, the statute results potentially in, 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 in criminal and civil penalties. So the Uniform Athlete Agent Act initially was a model statute that was created by a third party uh, institution of legal thinkers to address this issue that had not been in existence. So there could have been at the time that some states on uh, state legislatures had student athlete and agent bills uh, laws on the books, but they might have been inconsistent. And because Issues with unscrupulous uh, agents uh, were a problem that probably existed throughout the country, and you, there was the potential for inconsistent state laws. There was a public policy interest in making sure that um, the states had an opportunity to adopt a law that was similar, uh, that would be similar to all the to each state. And so the UAAA was created as a way for state legislatures to review the law and model their own law based on this model statute. And so there's these key different there's there's different key areas for um, what the Uniform Athlete Agent Act provides. And there's the duty uh, for athlete agents to register uh, with the state in which they're seeking to court student athletes. There's specific disclosure. Uh, requirements that the agent needs to make to the student athlete about the ramifications of signing, and then there's notifications that the student athlete and the agent must make to the university upon signing an agreement, and then there's potential penalties. So, athlete registration. The, the Uniform Athlete Agent Act requires agents to register uh, with the local uh, state in which he or she wishes to recruit student athletes and also then disclose what sort of qualifications they have. Um, now, the statute uh, also has the safe harbor provision that says that even if you don't register in that state in which you want to conduct business and begin recruiting a student athlete, you still have a week to register from the day you actually start courting that student athlete. But if you fail to do that, then you'll be in violation of that statute. Disclosure. So um, all agency contracts must be recorded, must be written. So they must be in a written form. It can't be oral and signed by the student athlete. But then there also needs to be language in that contract that clearly shows that that student that the student athlete will lose their eligibility to compete in intercollegiate athletics, and that that student athlete has the right to cancel the contract within 14 days of signing. Although it also is clear that the student athlete might not actually um, 
get their eligibility back to compete. So here's an example of um, a, a, a Athlete Agent Act that was adopted by the Florida legislature. And it was modeled after the Uniform Athlete Agent Act. So as an example, you see that every contract that is to be signed between a student athlete and a agent it must contain this language here that um, and it must be uh, close to where they're signing so it says if you sign the contract you may lose your eligibility to compete as a student athlete in your sport if you have an athletic director uh, within 72 hours after entering the contract you and your athlete agent must notify blah 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 um, you may cancel the contract within 14 days however cancellation of this contract may not reinstate your eligibility so right there a student athlete would see the ramifications of signing this uh, contract because, of course, uh, this would be a violation of the uh, amateurism aspects of NCAA uh, rules. So eligibility rules. Student athletes will lose their eligibility if they enter into this agency agreement with an agent or re retain an agent or accept some sort of benefit, such as transportation or impermissible benefits from the agent, or if they agree to be represented um, for the purposes of marketing their athletic ability and reputation. So if you've got a amateur uh, high school uh, uh, student who also plays basketball in the AAU, um, and they sign some, their parents in the, in the uh, and the students sign an agreement uh, to allow a third party to do their marketing in the future once they graduate from college, then that would be a potential violation of NCAA rules. So again, eligibility rules are important. And also in the Uniform Athlete Agent Act, um, there's a rule that says both the agent and student athlete must notify the athletic director about the agency agreement. And so um, here, um, the statute protects institutions from potentially being uh, subject to steep financial policy or penalties stemming from playing a, uh, a, a, a person who's no longer an amateur, which can be loss of scholarships, uh, loss of uh, instability sanctioned events, uh, loss of wins, etc., uh, loss of, of revenue. So um, going back here, um, there has been some criticism of the Uniform Athlete Agent Act in the sense that um, the law actually protects the university more than the student athlete because the student athlete still can lose their eligibility, whereas um, the um, university itself is usually protected or uh, has a cause of action against the agent or the uh, player for uh, any losses that it might incur. We've got some examples of prohibited conduct, um, so you can take a look at take a look at that. But um, oftentimes in the Uniform Athlete Agent Act, um, and it's it's whatever is adopted by the states. There's prohibitions. Uh, on, from, on the agent from making misleading statements or offering anything of value. So let's take a look here uh, if anything's on this. So I'm switching to the uh, Texas uh, Uniform Athlete Agent Act uh, counterpart. So um, we've got a potential uh, uh, requirement that um, that there cannot be a finding of false, misleading, or deceptive or fraudulent statements or or, or uh, representations, which will lead to tangible penalties for the athlete agent. So assume that you are your school starting running back. How would you react if you were approached by an agent? who promised perks like cash, an expensive car, and the ability to work out at an NFL team's training camp if you would sign with that player. Would you be tempted to sign? Why or why not? So I guess the question becomes, 
what uh, what is the student athlete's mindset? Um, do are they aware of the vi financial ramifications for uh, signing with the the agent? Uh, if it, do they know that it could be violations of the Uniform Athlete Agent Act that has been adopted by that state in which the student athlete attends school, school. Um, or uh, thinking potentially also more realistically, is that of consequence to the student athlete? Is a student athlete um, so um, such a, a good player that it's virtually a lock that the student athlete would be drafted and would be able to play at the next level? So. While legal issues uh, certainly might influence a student athlete's thinking, the realities of life could also potentially influence a student athlete. In addition to any states that have chosen to adopt the Uniform Athlete Agent Act as their own, um, another statute exists known as the Sport Agent Responsibility and Trust Act, which is called SPARTA. And this is a federal statute, so this is actually a statute that's on the books of the federal government. And it's looked as a supplement um, to the Uniform Athlete Agent Act. Like It, it sort of fills in uh, the gaps or works as a very simple sort of uh, basic protection um, for student athletes, um, but it, it really, it, in states that have no form of student athlete regulation. So um, here, the uh, the, the uh, statute provides um, protection by prohibiting agents from making false or misleading state statements, and there's some certain regu uh, rep uh, registration requirements, but it's not as comprehensive as what is in the Uniform Athlete Agent Act. And... In terms of professional athletes and athlete agents, because now they actually are um, no longer amateurs, any sort of issue that arises um, occurs in the context of the agent not being as skilled as he or she uh, holds themselves out to or engages in some sort of bad faith behavior of stealing money or, or acting in, in poor faith. And this is sort of where we saw the Jerry Argovitz case, where um, he was representing uh, a very, uh, a very sought-after running back, and Argovitz had, in addition to being the agent of this player, had um, gotten an interest, an ownership interest in a, in another professional uh, football team in a different um, league. And it was he had a vested interest in inducing his client to play not for the Detroit Lions, but play for his his own franchise because it would up the the publicity and excitement uh, of that league and that team, and maybe drive more people to attend games. And he would have a financial interest in that. But he never disclosed that to his player, and he engaged in all other. Um, a whole bunch of other course of self-dealing, which led the court to void the contract between the, the football player and Argovitz's team and rescind the contract. But that would be an example of a player agent a uh, acting in bad faith. But it also demonstrated that Argovitz was negotiating a contract between his client in the lines and then the client, his client in the new football team. So that's the primary job. And one of the primary skills of the agent is to be an effective negotiator. Um, but sometimes uh, agents serve as the financial advisor as well or consultant for that player or as their endorsement agent or marketing agent. But um, sort of a, be a best practice for um, student or for uh, professional athletes is, not, is to not have one person wearing all the hats. You want that person to, um, you want to have checks and balances. So it would behoove you to have uh, multiple people. Uh, with wearing only one hat. In terms of restrictions of agents and professional associations, this is where, we, again, we see players associations coming in, and they exist to protect uh, their athletes from any sort of fiduciary 
uh, any sort of breach of fiduciary duty or fraud or breach of contract. And this is also where the certification process comes into play. Um, and uh, you could log on to the websites of the different players associations to look at the qualifications that are required in order to be an agent. That includes educational requirements, disclosure uh, requirements for background checks, and, and passing an actual player uh, a certification agent certification test. And although this is um, a pretty um, a pretty uh, popular field, uh, being an agent, did you guys did you know that approximately half of all athlete agents do not represent a single active player? And that really goes to show that the threshold necessary to be an athlete agent is not that high, but actually being a competent agent, uh, obtaining and retaining clients is difficult. Uh, it's, it's a difficult threshold. So um, the life of an agent uh, can be difficult. It can uh, create many ethical as legal and moral dilemmas. So um, if you are interested in being an agent, um, there's certain um, uh, certain issues that are might be more likely to uh, come up uh, within your career. And, and in terms of competitive strategies uh, for sport managers involving agency issues and athlete agents, again, the law of contracts is really the guiding framework for agency relationships. So although agency, the law of agency cr creates and imposes fiduciary duties on the agent and the duty to uh, actually uh, pay what you're supposed to pay uh, uh, from the principal to the agent, um, contracts dictate um, sort of can, how best practices can be developed. So one best practices is put all agreements in writing and make sure that it's validly executed and it's in un clearly understandable contract. And also, um, future sport managers should educate themselves about any sort of legal restrictions that are placed on both athletes and agents, and what sort of rules are imposed by the NCAA and other amateur associations, as well as, the NF as, well as professional associations, so that sport managers have enough requisite knowledge to be able to plan accordingly, avoid potential legal issues that might come up, and then mitigate any liability if for some reason the sport manager is ensnared in a, le in, in, in a legal dilemma. Of course, from a student-athlete standpoint, and if you're working in athletics, um, the choice of conducting seminars for your student athletes to help educate them and understand what is legal and permissible is also going to be very helpful. So hopefully this was a, 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 a beneficial session and I look forward to seeing you guys next time.